welcome to today's conversation with our AGORBC artist in residence, Iveta Songyang Kang. Hi, Iveta. Um, my name is Dana Abusido. I'm the curatorial associate for projects and partnerships at uh, the AGO. Um, before we begin today, um, I'd like us to uh, take some time to consider where we are and um, the land we are lucky to work and live on. And um, the land the AGO is on is a Mississauga Anishinaabe uh, territory, Mississauga. It is also governed uh, by a treaty between the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Canadian government. Um, Toronto is Mississauga Anishinaabe territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat confederacies. Uh, and this program, uh, the AGO RBC Artists in Residence program, is generously supported by our signature partner, uh, RBC, which uh, brings me to why we're here today with Iveta, uh, who is um, our uh, second artist in residence for this year, for spring summer. And uh, for the past three months, Iveta has been uh, developing um, her project, uh, A String Figure, uh, which um, she uh, is um, working, she worked with, uh, with a group of friends and um, they uh, collaborated with her on this project. Some of them are with us today. Uh, so uh, thank you and hi to uh, Mira Bak, uh, Dong Hong Kang, Sophie Moreau, uh, Dong Yan Shen, uh, Karina Berndt, and uh, Eugene Lee. Um, this project started with Iveta uh, having conversations with uh, six of her friends, and uh, they were speaking about um, their lives during the pandemic and uh, the anxiety and stress they went through because of severe lockdowns and agoraphobia as well, the excessive uh, or the excessive anxiety uh, of outside exposure. Um, so all of these conversations then were tied together with a string figure game that Iveta wanted each one of them to uh, perform. Uh, so what happened is that she sent them a, a, a red string with a note that says, dear friends, uh, welcome to our ephemeral string figure intersection. This is your string. Do remember to bring it always with you wherever you go. Your string has been shipped. So each of the friends played their own version of a, cradle, a cat's cradle or a, a string figure game, and it all differs uh, based on where they were or their personal memories uh, playing this game. And then the videos would travel from one artist to the other or from one friend to the other, and uh, they would then perform their own version of it. Um, and you can look at the Cradle's Cat game as this agency that unified all of them and unified all of their stories. And um, today, Iveta will perform uh, this residency project that she developed, Proposition 3 Strength Figure. And um, before I uh, pass on the mic to uh, Iveta, I'd like to uh, invite all of you tomorrow uh, to visit the AGO uh, and go to our concourse level, to the Artist in Residence Studio, uh, where Iveta uh, will have uh, open studio hours and uh, you can see the process of making this project. Uh, she's going to be there from two p.m. to 6 30 so uh, be many and we, we look forward to see you and um, I hand it over to you Iveta take it away <laughs> thank you our conversations are ephemeral yet becoming very living matters our conversations are ephemeral, yet becoming very living matters that will lubricate friction between you and me. Between us, in between me and me. Our conversations are ephemeral and becoming very living matters. Our conversations are ephemeral and becoming very living matters that will circulate within us. Our conversations are ephemeral 
So becoming very living matters that will finally circulate time within us. I had always been told that time was linear. The linear fabric of time was a given premise. When I was abandoned by my first serious love and had an abortion at 22, I lived in my tiny room for six months. Very straightforward and simple of six months life. I'm telling you, I didn't put a single footstep outside. Given the growing interest within the humanities and social sciences with the subject of space, it is not surprising that agoraphobia, which is so obviously spatial, has emerged as a central trope for comprehending the contours of social reality. I didn't feel any curiosity about what I was surrounded by or why. The room wasn't rented under my name, it was my friends who was also a way for self-healing from her breakup. She chose to get away from the place while I decided to get myself stuck there. It was about a hundred square feet room with an old CRT TV. My life was being dragged into a digital screen made of many pixels. I watched one TV program being aired 24-7 for six consecutive months. It was a reality show where seven people traveled together here and there. How ironic, isn't it? It was a little after when I realized when space stops, time also stops. 
I can't remember any household items in the room except a few images of my cat. When thinking of humans' massive migration, I couldn't get my head around how all individuals were able to move to somewhere that they didn't know about at all. The term agoraphobia means fear of open spaces, but is more appropriately described as a fear of being any place where one might feel alone and vulnerable to fear and panic. Avoidance in response to this fear is a central feature of agoraphobia. When I'm not even sure if I sought a peaceful mind by trapping myself in the room, Inevitably, I can't understand what it would feel like to stand alone in desert, seas, and continent countries unknown to me. Agoraphobic persons often describe feeling trapped by an ever-present threat of panic and their belief that they cannot risk leaving safe havens such as home. And even people, those many, 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 and many, 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 many people unknown to me. In my 20s, people's questions and words defined me and defined what I did. And there was no true me, all of the questions and words. In the room that devoured my six months, I hypothetically speculated all kinds of hatred from other people. And in this hypothetical speculation, there was no true me either. Oftentimes, I feel communication is nearly impossible, whether or not it is a singular communication or plural forms, the life has kept telling me to learn the single fact. Perhaps this might have been one of the primary reasons why almost every human activity that has been developed and practiced in the history is so communicatory and communicative in the search of communication as an attempt to make a conversation.
Watching Bullet Her 7 a long film, I even more automated to the thought. It became obvious when I suddenly felt so tired after a three hour long conversation with people who still tempted to express my thoughts or lingering while listening to them talking. What is that I have in my heart yearning to be spoken out? Yet, one thing that came back to me as I recall the memory of the agoraphobic life in the room is that I often fell asleep while holding my phone that didn't ring at all, sadly, but was always fully charged. But I denied this fact to avoid the other memories that might have kept clinging to me if I had admitted it and that might have affecting every part of my current ears. Home is where the heart is. The home of a friend is never far away. These sentiments cast the home as a safe haven. Yet paradoxically, while at home Meg spends much of her time ruminating over past experiences of panic and imagining similar experiences in other hypothetical situations, home is not a safe haven, after all. It does not protect her from being engulfed by reconstructions of past events that channel rising tides of panic into the present. Home is a place where distressing emotions from past times and places creep upon. So I decided to live like a nomad, freed from the suffocating memories of my past. Because her anxieties is caught in dilemmas of temporality, tied to the inhospitable context of the here and now at the same time as imagining a there and then. To emancipate myself from the recurring sorrow. No matter how desperately I try to avoid the ugly part of my past, I now feel that I've desired to tell you my stories. My memories, my thoughts and my feelings. It is only a recent realization that I still carry residues of the memories. Although I moved to the opposite part of the globe from South Korea to live my third life. It is like that if someone closes the window without giving me a signal I'll just right away be dragged to the agoraphobic state of my past.
But I know this time would be different because I've experienced strings that have snugly and loosely been hanging over my windows and doors. narrative is critical to understanding how people perceive themselves and others in their worlds. We view stories not as flawed renditions of reality, but as windows into individual and collective theories of reality. The window, the window, a window, and windows to weave the strings over and beyond our windows and feel the air that we all together breathe. We have all experienced that our conversations of potency for them came to a halt when the shared air and shared touching became dangerous, infectious, making people sick and even die. That made me and you close our windows and doors. That also made me and you feel anxious when speaking in an open space or any places out of outside of your home. Every step going outside was anxious, and every time seeing someone talking outside without masks was anxious. I and you lived in total oblivion where our stories for each other were non-existent. The establishment of a coherent and resonant story is the therapeutic end. Some friends have expressed their will to share words for the surrounding household items with me. They have expressed that we could even exchange a few words describing our everyday lives. They knocked on my window and I got a sign of courage. And I accepted, saying that I would also share words of the surrounding items and objects around me. We agree that 
we would be willing to observe how this word of our, us will be growing, turning into stories. By delving into these narratives, we can enter into her panic where she lives it, in her own tellings, in her own words, and we can witness the psychological universe that Meg inhabits taking shape around her. By delving into these narratives, we can enter into my and your panic where I and you live it, in my and you our own tellings, in my and your own words. And we can witness the psychological universe that I and you inhabit taking shape around me and you. From Dong Hoon. In the morning of the 18th June 2022, on the light, next to speaker, messy home, breezy weather, unexpected early morning, being excited for a trip. At the night of the 18th June 2022, the string is in my bag, still messy home, wide open window, singing birds, late night or early morning due to heat wave, being exhausted. From Dongan. In the morning of the 1st July 2022, exhausted, alarm, tired, sleepy, soreness, brown noise. At the night of the 1st July 2022, wind, near a balcony, on the tea table, glass surface, decorations below Chinese knots. From Wairu, in the morning of the 16th June 2022, on the bookshelves, Morning right after a nightmare, birds singing from the window, bit feeling dry. At the night of the 16th June 2022, same bookshelves, scent of candle, eucalyptus, yellow ish lights, a favorite t-shirt, scattered sounds. From Corinna, in the morning of the 7th July 2022, blue and turquoise, daylight a comfortable spot, a treat just outside the window. At the night of the 7th July 2022, an open diary, more paper than pens, a spiky ball for muscle release. From Sophie, in the morning of the 26th June 2022, breakfast, kitchen table, am I doing this right? Cold morning, knee clean clothes, strange start at the night of the 26th June 2022, date night, Netflix, cozy on couch, no touching. Look after me. From Yudin, in the morning of the 11th July 2022, staircase, dark brown wooden and laminate floor, loud pops on from the neighbors, blue corduroy shirt, navy jacket, brown coat, white jacket on coat hanger, Yudo stair poster reading, I will survive, white handrails painted over many times. At the night of the 11th July 2022, London DLR train stopping at Canary Wharf, light from the setting sun and the white panel lights inside the train freckled with dust and tiny dead bugs, the river over the window, passing West India Key Station, sound of friction between the train and the tracks, slightly tipsy. My words then acquire visuals, and they both acquire stories when you receive, perceive, and love to read them. Although these stories vary in content and in the circumstances of telling, they share a common structure.
like exposing the interior scaffolding of a building, delineating narrative structure reveals the linguistic resources tellers habitually draw on to create and maintain emotions, actions, and identities. Words and letters shouldn't be infectious, yet maybe letting us seep into each other's life sensories. Digital photos shouldn't be tangible, yet maybe letting us feel invited to see some intimate parts of your stories and lives. Digital self of us can gain connected stories through them. They don't have corporeal movement, but they move in our storytelling. And I call them very ephemeral conversations around string figures. I wonder, my friends, if I can reach out to you, ask for your forgiveness and tenderness, and confess that I've been meaning to tell you about my fear. Then, would you let me recast my stories of fear to you? Would you be willing to recast your stories of fear to me? Hi everyone, <laughs> this feels like a radio station. Uh, thank you for coming here to listen to me and chat with me. I've turned this presentation into a reading, citing and sharing, chatting performance. First of all, I really want to thank all my friend participants uh, who did the virtual string figures with me. Miru, Donghun, uh, Sophie, Dongyan, Karina and Eugene. Uh, they all live in different countries and cities currently, so all the virtual conversations I had with them always unfolded in different time zones. So after all, time isn't linear. I also want to really thank you for the Asia team, Paula and Dana especially, and all the mentors, and Camilla Grisky and my partner in Ijo and Jisoo for supporting the whole project.
Thank you. Uh, okay. So now that my performance is finished, if you have any questions or thoughts or anything that you want to share, please write it in the Q&A room. Uh, I have a, one question from Amy Furness, who is a librarian at the AGO uh, Library and Archive. It's it's from the uh, I'm I'm sure all of you can see the list of bibliography and citations that Natalie shared in the chat, and the the part about speculative fabulation and string figures is from Donna Haraway's book called Staying with the Trouble. Thank you, Afanta. This performance was just awesome. I was uh, chatting with my colleagues while you were presenting that it looks amazing on the screen and it's so wholesome uh, to see how you, in a very difficult time at the beginning of the pandemic, you started Tender Hands, the mail list, and then it developed into uh, Proposition 3, uh, String Figure. Um, I was wondering from all these exchanges that you had with the with the artist friends and um, you know, the, the, the conversations that were over Zoom and then you did the transcription. How did you, how did you feel this content turned into a story that then uh, was, uh, you know, linked to the uh, string figure game? And how did you feel working collaboratively with six people who live in different places and different time zones and, and all that um, maybe uh, organization part of the project? How, how did you feel it all, you know, tied itself together and, and weaved into this, uh, I love to call it collage in motion? <laughs> I think answering your question, Dana, would also be a good answer for Natalie's question as well, because I, I think every conversation I had uh, was a uh, not of the continuous string figure play that I'm playing with my friends, and I actually don't want to call it catch cradle because catch cradle is a kind of term, this kind of termed by uh, English people who sort of learned these string figure games from East Asian countries. So I'll just go by string figures here. Uh, what was your question? <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> I, 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 was, I think there are like two questions. Yeah, I, I was I was interested in the part where um, you had these conversations with the, with your artist friends who who live in different places and in different time zones. And mm -hmm. I know the starting point was talking about agoraphobia and uh, mm -hmm. the anxieties mm -hmm. they faced with the mm -hmm. pandemic, but it also grew to personal stories and exchanging, uh, you know, life events. And it wasn't just about uh, agoraphobia. So I was wondering how did this content um, uh, inspire you yeah. in the project and how how I think what, what my question is also when you transcribe those interviews like yeah. it's very personal they're very one-on-one -on -one conversations so very personal and I think um, it is always exciting to have someone who's willing to share that much and mm -hmm. be very uh, honest and open and vulnerable so um, I just wanted to hear your uh, thoughts on this yeah yeah so like Talking with these friends who lived in different time zones wasn't easy for me, for them, of course, I think. Uh, it's it's really interesting because all of these friends, I've met them like once or we've only spent like three months at a, the um, same artist residency program in Germany, but we didn't really talk much because we were busy doing our respective works there. Mm -hmm. And even like one of the friends, Eugene, I've never met in person. I've never met her in person. We've always just exchanged emails. But what is what was pretty interesting and even comforting for me was during the pandemic, somehow I've got closer to some of these friends because of probably because of this more accessible living with you know, in the internet lives and digital environment. So I was, we sort of exchanged a lot of emails with some of them and then the other some will just like say hi, but I have some concerns or worrisome if when like uh, Asian hate crimes 
searched and because some of them are Asian, Korean, so I would just worry about them as much as I worry about myself. So that those kind of very subliminal, but very existing, strongly existing feelings were there. And then it was really, really generous of them when I invited them, they were like, yes. Because I didn't even tell them what I was going to do exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll just say yes. And then trend, we, I think I had a, like 14 or 12 conversations, but we didn't talk about string figures at all. Oh, okay. would, I would to sort of prepare some topics, but I would just also at the same time let us talk about whatever they came to us. And I think because of this very intimate nature yeah. of chatting on Zoom, we are sort of able to talk about anxiety because everyone, everyone feels uh -huh. anxiety and at different temperatures and levels, I guess. Yeah. But we'll talk about anxiety and then our circumstances are somehow aligned at some point because many, all of them are artists. All of them are doing their own art project. So when I say something, they have already given understanding of what I was sort of referring to. So in that sense, our conversation just entangled beautifully and then when i will need to transcribe this conversations because this whole project uh also accompanies like text work yeah. and then when it comes to transcription i because it's their memories they share their memories they share their stories so i didn't want to you know cut and chop chop and paste yeah. those stories by my lens so i sort of try really try to be really careful in terms of how to putting things together and even just like try just try to fictionalize everything even so i when you if you everyone if you can go to the uh, asia web page they're they're like trans like kind of i'll call it transcription poem mm -hmm. where you see a lot of dashes and dots and those dashes and dots sort of symbolize or sort of met working as a metaphors for how what kind of emotional feelings that we me and my friends were having when having a one conversation so that's just my sort of acknowledgement uh, functioning as an interlocutor there yeah yeah and uh, thank you for mentioning the website so um, everyone can now have a look at the digital presentation of, of the project and i also encourage everyone to check uh, Iveta's uh, social media account where she shared step by step how she developed uh, the project and how she was in touch with all her friends we have a good quest a really nice question uh from paula paletto um she's thanking you for the presentation and i was wondering uh why did you choose the red color for the string and uh can we also ask you about the choice of uh, color behind you, the lighting behind you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the color of the string, I'm not sure if Camilla like Risky is here. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation with Camilla Krisky, who is the author of seven, eight books, like wow. public uh, public publication, like books about string string figure games and catch cradle. And she was super, super generous to invite me to her house. And then we talked and then she was saying that because we sort of, by playing string figures, catch cradle, we would present ourselves as a storyteller. Wow. Then the story has to be highlighted, not me. So that is why she would always sort of wear black whereas the string is red. And I think there was a little like reference to this Chinese myth where uh, it's called, I think, red string, red string relationship or something. Mm. It's about this, you know, you, you always, you're born with like a string, invisible but red string, mm. like tied around your finger. And then when you meet someone who is really, really fitting to your life, then you, your string is sort of automatically connected to the person's string. So that string in that means is actually red. And then uh, my, my tone of my voice, oh, artificial voice. I try to change it to a uh, gender neutral voice actually on my Mac, but uh, it didn't allow me to do it. So I just <laughs> went by with the male voice, but I think it might, 
I can think about further like implications of using that later, probably. Yeah. And why pink room? Yeah. Uh, this is actually our default setting for night times. <laughs> <laughs> but I found it pretty, I found it pretty suiting. And also at the same time, this, the, the story that I was telling you was pretty personal, although a little part of a little small parts were fictionalized. So I sort of became personal, emotional. So I chose a suiting light. Well, it looks great. And uh, your choice of music as well really went well with the, uh, the collage that you, you showed us of the performance. Um, so Aveta, I wanted to, um, you know, maybe end it here, but we still have a couple of more minutes if you have anything to share, any closing notes. Um, and I think also um, it's great that tomorrow you have the open, uh, open studio so people can also come visit and see the installation you created uh, at uh, the studio. And I know you've created also a, a, a work opposite of a string figure uh, proposition three. So if you wanna tell us more about it and how you, in the last minutes maybe, how did you do the transcriptions because you did not write everything you you left spaces for certain words and i think it's quite interesting to to share that with everyone you mean in the transcription poem yes in the structure poem. that is greatly inspired by the number five in the bibliography list mm -hmm. the book called constructing panic the discourse of agoraphobia uh so this there these two authors, one is psychiatrist and the other one was linguistic, and they went to see this patient named Megan, Megan, I think, and they sort of, because, you know, although there could be many, many reasons of why, like, agoraphobia patients are suffering and why they can't go outside, sometimes it might look weird like not understandable mm. but they sort of found that uh like felt that actually that uh, this one agoraphobia patient or even just anxiety patient would be not only stuck in their houses but also in stuck in their past memories like trauma memories and you know like some traumatic memories always keep clinging to you clinging to me always like kind of dragging you into the past moment and when that sort of psychological phenomenon is getting worse uh it might be a kind of trigger for agoraphobia and uh, when these two people met this megan they didn't they just let the person's you know, speak and recast all of the traumatic memories of hers, not to interruption at all. And they didn't even like give, you know, give any psychiatric, psych psychiatric treatment or instructions. They just hear and listen to this person's story. And in the book, they use two things, dashes and pauses of seconds sort of to reenact how traumatic one memory of Megan was and still is. So they sort of, I, I found that as a kind of respectful gesture for this story storyteller who, to this patient who actually in, experienced the traumatic memory. So that was there, I think, because I didn't, like I said, I didn't want to working as an editor, like full controlling mm. all of the stories and memories that my friends shared. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. So Eric Cheng Yang asked a question. Can you provide a bit contextual info on the space used in the 3D rendering? AKA the 3D generated gallery view of proposition three on AG website. Yes. Uh, it is sort of it sort of became my general practice to generate 3D rendering gallery views because you know, as an emerging artist, as a young artist, I can't have all the resources that might have been really helpful to document my work. So uh for the even like previous work I made last year, uh, last year I sort of asked my partner 
to create 3D rendering gallery views so that the audiences or curators and art like peer artists, artists friends would see at least able to see, kind of imagine the whole picture if the installation, the work is properly well installed. So I chose that really kind of bunker kind of space for this specific 3D rendering images because I wanted to have some private, intimate, but kind of rotten space, not open space, but still kind of open. And then this bunker image for, for, for the background of the 3D rendering images just came up and I really liked it. Uh, you can see that there are seven channel videos, one channel, which is kind of a recording version of the performance I gave, I just gave, and the other six channel videos are actually the uh, video documentation of my six friends reenacting their string figures in front of their cell phones. And there are collections of photos, and some of the photos are what I showed you, like during the performance, those, you know, those, uh, Docu that, that documentation of photos that my friends took every day for four days for each of them. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of a context and kind of a work that's part of the 3D rendering images. Thank you. Uh, right, so, thank you. Um, so, Aveta, thank you so much uh, for uh, this presentation today, um, and um, I, I just I, I want to say that it was such an incredible uh, opportunity to work with you and see how you uh, have been working so diligently uh, from the beginning and the research findings that you shared with us. I I will always miss our weekly meetings, but I'm sure uh, we're going to stay in touch and and see how maybe this project will develop and you'll do more propositions. Um, yes. And I want to thank everyone who attended this conversation today um, and our signature partner, RBC, uh, for supporting the Artists in Residence program. Um, thank you for all your questions and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for thank joining you, this time. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.